one of advisors gave this great example, which they call the, the rock problem versus the monkey problem. They say there's two types of problem that, that, and two types of the way that people define problem. So there's the rock problem, which is, I tell you, Scott, listen, man, um, I have a big rock in my garden that I need to move. The rock is big. If we are two people and we lift it together, we can move it uh, 20 feet from where we are today. That's a very yeah. simple, very defined problem. Uh, we know where the rock is. We know what it needed for moving the rock. And then there's the monkey problem, which is I call you, Scott, and I'd say, listen, man, uh, my pet monkey is sick. I need to drop it off to you right now. Uh, I have to go because I have to work. All of a sudden, you don't know what to do with this monkey. Remote forces creation of rock problem is what I'm trying to say. Meanwhile, working in agencies, I've seen a lot of monkey problems. I've seen a lot of, you know, urgency of let's call a meeting for this because a client just called and said there is a problem, which is literally the definition of the monkey problem. And we all went yeah. into this room and there was no structure around how do we define the solution problem. So I think that remote works better 99% of the case. The only case where actually being in a room makes more sense to me is the case where there needs to be a lot of time spent together in an unstructured conversation to try to get to the bottom of strategic conversation. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Leading from Afar, a podcast by remote leaders for remote leaders, aimed at sharing knowledge and experience to help make remote awesome within your companies. I'm Scott Markovitz. I was the first hire at Envision and helped build the foundations of the company for marketing, sales, product, operations, and pretty much everything in between. I've also mentored and consulted with hundreds of early stage startups, including a bunch of remote ones. Each episode, we'll speak about hot topics, trends, and the future of remote work. We'll also interview some super smart leaders at all levels of remote teams and introduce you to new tools that can help you succeed as a remote leader. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to today's show with me, Scott Markovitz. Today, I'm joined by a longtime friend, Jonathan Wadowski, who is the CEO and co-founder of Maze Design. And Joe, as I call him, launched Maze remotely three and a half years ago to help teams do user research remotely, whether product or marketing or UX or things in between. So I wanted to bring him in today to speak about how to collaborate most effective, effectively remotely, especially within a growing and dispersed team as his that's grown from eight people pre-pandemic to over 130 today. We started off our conversation by discussing whether remote collaboration and the tools available can be as effective as the physical conference room and whiteboard. We also talked about how his team specifically collaborates and makes strategic and product decisions remotely. And we also talked about how his team and his products move towards async. And we also spoke about his team and products move towards asynchronous communication and collaboration. So, hope you enjoy the show. Hey, Joe, how are you today? Hey, Scott, good to see you. How are you? You too, you too. I'm uh, glad to see you're, you're feeling better. How was uh, the past week? You haven't been feeling so well last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was anticipating COVID and it was not COVID in the end. So, lost at the lottery, it feel. Uh, but yeah, I've been, I've been, I've seen better days, but now it's all, all the better. Uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been pretty much everywhere. We've had COVID cases all over maze. Uh, so it's interesting because it's, uh, it's unifying in a way, right? Working in 33 countries and having COVID just yeah. so spread out that everyone can relate to everyone's experience. It's been, it's been interesting. Yeah, it's also been crazy times. I think even going back to the beginning of any time, somebody, at least in my home, had a runny nose or a cough or this. It's like the first thing things like, oh, COVID test, COVID test. And my wife all the time, I think one of my kid, my daughter has congested, and so I said, oh, maybe I'll give her like a COVID test this morning. I'm like, why is it only COVID? But there's so many things like we've gone and she had like a strep test two weeks ago that came back negative. Maybe it was like a virus and there's the flu going around and there's like COVID and all this kind of chaos. It's like, mm -hmm. oh man, <laughs> you just can't it's win. Weird. It's just crazy stuff. You just can't win. It's, uh, we live in a world where coughing is illegal as well now. So it's just, you can cough outside. It's, it's, it's weird. Yeah. Um, we went, we went to Greece with my girlfriend. I was a bit sick. I started coughing in the restaurant and everyone gives you a sad eye. Like it's, you know, it's illegal. So yeah. it's, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. it's interesting. It's been a very interesting development of things. It, it's been quite interesting. Now, anytime I'm, I'm inside and somebody coughs, it's like maybe once, like, or no, we'll give them no benefit of the doubt, but they cough like a second or third time. It's like, 
what the hell are you doing here? Like, you should know better. You should be out some, somewhere else. And that first time after the first wave last, I don't know what, like, almost like two summers ago in Israel, we were, I think, past the first wave pretty much, I think, before everybody else. And the first time I went out to like a restaurant, it was so nice. It was an outdoor restaurant. It was great. And all of a sudden, you see somebody cough and, and, or sneeze over there and you're kind of like getting the mask on. And you're like, oh. <laughs> but you're outdoors and the wave is past. And like, this thing's exactly you just you'd have like i guess that embedded fear and that trauma inside of somebody coughing and sneezing it's it'd be interesting to see psychologically how long this lasts so like once eventually this pandemic ends like when that when that mentally changes i think i think we're doomed i think at this point in time now a whole generation is just doomed to be you know afraid of anyone that that's need or cough um but yeah it's been crazy it's been even even crazier i would say for the parents we we've had a bunch of new parents mm. At Maze. And so um, the one that, you know, kids kids are basically uh, the magnet, right? So it's uh, <laughs> COVID, is COVID yes, they are. everywhere in their home. And I, I feel like remote has helped a lot for them as well. Like uh, the ability to stay yeah. home, to not be reliant on support. It's, it's just been, uh, yeah, I've seen the opposite where, you know, you have to go to work, you have to find replacements, you have to find someone who can take up. It's just, it's, it's a nightmare to deal with. So it's... Uh, yeah, at least that, that was that, I feel. Did, did you experience any of this on your end? Yeah, I, I'd say it's just two sides of the coin I'm totally on this. And I, I've spoken about this on previous episodes. On one side, I've had like this kind of opening question of other people when you work remotely, do you take sick days off, right? Because mm -hmm. it used to be in that old mentality. You had to go, you had to get on the bus or train, 60 minutes, go out, it's raining, it's cold. It's like this and that and the other. You don't have medicine, you don't have tea. But when you're at home, you have all those things. It's warm, it's comfortable, you're in your bed. So are people like less likely to take that time off or do they feel like I really have to be sick in order to take that time off because I'm at home, I'm in bed and I have my tea, I have my medicine. I'm not, I'm not going, I'm not schlepping outside. So, mm -hmm. so and that's kind of to your point, it's, it's great because the parents are home. So they, they don't themselves have to take a day off and worry about the kids. Like you have that right environment yeah. where you can take care of the kids. You can be there. You don't have to worry. Um, I think it's fantastic, but I feel on the other, yeah. other side, yeah. um, for me, I've, I guess been battling, I'll call it at some point, some like crazy anxiety and stress of when the mm -hmm. kids, especially when the kids were home during lockdowns or quarantines. And you know, I've been working remotely for 10 years, mostly from the house. Yeah. And it used to be, I had an we'll call like my nine to five was like my work time. And everybody knew when they came home from school, like the door was closed, mm -hmm. like don't, don't come, no bother, don't knock on the door. And then after like five o'clock, then it was like the family time. It was two universes were like separated apart, even though it was at home. But when the pandemic hit and there's lockdowns and you know, luckily my, my two older boys were learning through Zoom. So iPads and yeah. unlock and the Zoom links and this and that one. And, and when, all of a sudden that happened, like the two worlds collapsed on each other. And I think the same thing has yeah. happened through here, which has been very frustrating that, especially said kids are, are magnets for diseases. I think it was last year in like a two month, two or three month period, I think it was between, you know, the holidays in like September to the end of the year. I think one of my kids was in like quarantine. It must've been like five times because somebody in the class had gotten, gotten it. And it was literally like every two, three weeks, bang, 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 like back and forth. It's just... So for me, that part was just horrible, you know, always having something and like yeah. not having that separation of time. And you know, thankfully they were feeling fine, but they're not having that separation of, of work and family time. So I think there's, there's a lot of benefits on one side we saw this, and on the other side, at least for me, like the, the stress levels and anxiety levels have been uh, significantly <laughs> higher. <laughs> yeah, I get that. And you mentioned as well that, so you have your, I, I'm, I'm assuming you have an office space in, in your home as well. The, how yep. did you find that? Uh, you, you spoke a lot about the time separation between, you know, the nine to five for your work and then the rest yep. of your family. Do you find it useful as well to have a, um, let's say, a separation between your work? And do you, do you go back to your office even on non-office hours? I'd say yes. I mean, I, I'm actually at the point where now I think I'm probably looking to get out of the house physically um, at least yeah. a couple times a week and I'll go work at a co-working yeah. space or something, again, just to really have that difference. Um Said, for me, I think I really need that separation mm -hmm. of just, okay, here's, there's nothing else to focus on. And again, I think it's because the last two years there have been such ins and outs and now the babysitting ones come up and my daughter's nursery is now. So you got to just 
this is here. I'm like in total focus time. I'm total work time. There's, I, I can't be distracted because I can't be doing things. I can't be there. Um, yeah, I think it's, for me, it's helped. Um, and it just, again, yeah, may yeah. have been the different scenario where before the kids were coming home at, let's say three thirty, four o'clock. So for like the hour, an hour and a half, they knew, okay, no, don't, don't knock on the door. You know, daddy finishes his work at whatever five o'clock and then he comes and does with us. But like, once it turns on the COVID again, you need school, you need this. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I need this. And this one's bothering me. And again, like there's two worlds just don't separate. And it, as a worker, like, okay, I felt a lot of times I was going back on the evening times, going back to do work because that was the quiet time. The kids are now asleep. Now this is like my focus time to do work or to do those things I need to do. Then maybe I couldn't do throughout the rest of the day. So it's been a lot of juggling, a lot of trying to find times and kind of cutting up the day to find like that right opportunity to try to be most productive and still be able to mix and match uh, between the, the two different worlds that are here. Yeah, that's good. That made with a lot of parents just adapt their schedule, right? It was uh, when the kids are home, then you have the flexibility yeah. to actually just change the way that you work and change your hours. And I think that's also part of the beauty of it, right? It's that you're not tied to a yeah. specific schedule. You're tied to just your mission and what you need to do. So it's if 2 to 4 p.m. is the time that you want to spend with your kids because they're at home, then, then do that, right? Yeah. Like there's no nothing pushing you against that. So yeah, that's been excellent. Uh, that's been really good. Yeah. At least for that. Yeah, I think this is the biggest thing that's come out of the last two years of you know, the great resignation, the future of work. I don't think it's the low, remote work itself. It's people have now been able to spend time with their families and do things and have that better quality of life where they get to enjoy, you know, intertwine work and life into a single you know, cohesive uh, day-to-day operation. And I think that's been like the great crux of you know, resignations or changes from driving a truck to you know, driving an Uber or pushing for remote work that, hey, I get to live the life that I want to do on kind of my own schedule. And now the four day work week and you know, nine to fives are going away. This is definitely the way we're moving, but uh, I guess not the, not the topic for today. Um, so usually we'll try to kind of get, get back on track and you know, first and most importantly, Joe, it's been obviously fantastic to, to get you here. I know we've been talking about uh, this for, for quite a while. So thank you so much for joining. Um, usually the way to start is just introduce yourself a little bit and tell us a little bit about the origin story of Maze. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Jonathan Tarr is born and raised. My accent is the dead giveaway here. Um, so yeah, I've been in product my whole life before Maze, before everything really, I was designing websites and apps when I was 12 years old, I was, well, also we're collecting Pokemon cards. I was also collecting Pokemon cards, so I'm not judging. Uh, I was, I was building <laughs> websites, I was building for the web. Um, after college, I, I became lead UX in different agencies in Paris, where my role was teaching people how to do design and teaching people how to do research and then ultimately sell those these things. And the thing that was interesting at the time was that uh, research was very hard to sell in agency. It was almost impossible to sell. Uh, what yeah. we faced was going to clients and saying, we're going to spend the next five weeks trying to find five people that are willing to come to our office. Uh, spend hours with researchers and the designers, you know, the, the glass window and everything. And then at the end of all of this, we're going to get a five data point report that we're going to share with the customers. But the reality was that in the span of these five weeks, A, we had time to build the actual products and B, um, it would cost A, between 25 to 70 K, right. To just get started with this project. So clients were pushing back and the, despite the fact that they knew that it was extremely important for them to understand their customers better and run research was always impossible to to sell and so well this is where we experienced the pain of research the true story of maze came from the last startup that we created with my co-founder um so quick word on my co-founder as well thomas uh we've been working together for the past 10 years almost now he's what i like to call my co soulmate uh we work together on everything uh <laughs> previous agency that we started Amazing. now maze. um and we were building a messaging app for gamers. So literally nothing to do with what we're doing today. Uh, we were building Discord right before Discord. Sure. We were backed by Fnatic, which was the biggest and largest pro gaming team in the world. And because of that backing, yeah. we had thousands of people in a waiting list eager to try out our product. And what's funny was that at the time we thought, how do we get our prototype, which was an Envision prototype at the time. Uh, yeah. From Envision at the time. Um, how do you get this intelligent product in front of the eyes of these thousands of people without having to look at yeah. all of these individual sessions to understand what was happening? So we downloaded the intelligent prototype. We started putting analytics on top of everything with this idea that if we were able to understand the data at scale, we would be able to change the way that we conduct research. 
we send out the test to 5,000 people, we get 2.5 thousand responses in a couple of hours. So coming from a world where five responses in five weeks was basically opening champagne, that was entirely yeah. mind-blowing. But on top of that, all of a sudden, we realized that it was a rethinking of the product development process, that all of a sudden the learnings could happen before you actually build the thing, right? And so that's what led to Maze uh, a year later. That, that's how we got started. And so three years and a half ago, we started building Maze with this idea that we wanted to democratize research. And for us, that meant three things. It meant research should be run by companies of all size, meaning smaller startup yep. as much as IBM and SAP. It should be run by any industry because at the end of the day, anyone that creates customer facing experiences should be able to test those experiences. So we sell to Porsche and we sell to Walmart and we sell to the non-traditional customers that you would think of when you think of research. And then yep. finally, and I think this is the most important thing on this story is that we, we sell research to anyone within the organization, meaning designers, product managers, product marketers, everyone that basically has decisions to make, we give them the power to make those decisions. Because the key yep. pillar we built made on was if research is still a small part of the organization, both in terms of headcount and in terms of resources, then how do we make learning something that can happen everywhere? And I think that Figma had a, did a great job at making design conversation happen everywhere and not making everyone a designer. We're doing the same thing yep. for research, which is making research conversation happen everywhere within the org and making it normal for people to talk about research. So that's been the journey. Um, we've been at it for three years and a half now. We are 120 in 33 countries. So we've been remote before it was yes. cool to be remote. Um, indeed, indeed. Yeah, it's been, it's been quite the scale. That's awesome. It's only been three and a half years? It, yeah. <laughs> that, that feels like self <laughs> <years>, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I feel like I was thinking like five, six years ago then I, from the vision side, I'm like, all right, when, when are we buying these people? Because this is just like the next core piece of, of functionality that needs to be built into vision. And wow, three and a half, oh my, man, maybe next time it's slowed down. This usually runs fast, but I guess in this case, it's, uh, it goes slow. <laughs> it's insane. Um, it's insane. But, We're celebrating three years for some people in the company, you know, and it's like, if you've been here three years, this is insane. Like this is... Yeah, I don't know. It's mind blowing. It's mind blowing. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so, the focus of the conversation what to do with you today is around the idea of remote collaboration. Obviously, mm -hmm. Maze is a tool that's built for that and help people in in different spaces get that feedback and collaborate with each other. Mm -hmm. And it's been interesting that I've heard multiple, many times, including from quite a few remote leaders and advocates, saying that they hey. There's really nothing like being in the same room, same room with having a whiteboard there. Doing this probably for for ten years yourself and building a company in the space. You know, do you actually feel that way? You know, is it true that the digital experience isn't as effective of again five or six people being in a room with a physical whiteboard and, and markers? So, so I'm going to try to make this answer as short as possible, but it's going to be a long one anyway. <laughs> um, I think there's elements of truth to it. I think there are, there are cases where being in the same room and collaborating, and we do it at Mate, right? Like we do quarterly uh, board meeting plus uh, management team meeting, so where we actually gather quarterly. I think, so, de depending on the type of problem, I think remote is actually better at problem solving because remote forces people to be intentional both about shaping the problems and shaping the solution. Meaning that if you're running into remote conversation, you if you set up a meeting in a remote setting, you need to be very intentionally what you're trying to solve with this meeting. So it forces yep. the conversation to be very structured. The same thing can be said for the async collaboration and problem solving and collaboration, right? Which is if you don't define the problems properly, people are not going to collaborate with you, right? We have yep. um, one of our, we're part of Reforge, which is uh, an advisory program for startup. And we have one of our advisors gave this great example, which they call the, the rock problem versus the monkey problem. And they say there's two types of problem that, that and two types of people, the way that people define problem. And so there's the rock problem, which is, I tell you, Scott, listen, man, um, I have a big rock in my garden that I need to move. The rock is big. And if we are two people and we lift it together, we can move it uh, 20 feet from where we are today. That's a very yeah. simple, very defined problem. Uh, we know where the rock is. We know what it needed for moving the rock. And then there's the monkey problem, which is, I call you, Scott, and I say, listen, man, uh, my pet monkey is sick. I need to drop it off to you right now. Uh, I have to go because I have to work. And so all of a sudden, you don't know what to do with this monkey, right? You have a monkey at home. Mm -hmm. that just you, you don't, yeah. The problem is very, very important. Sure, so sure. one of the values that, yeah, go, go ahead. 
no, no, yeah, yeah. No, it makes, oh, okay. the no, example it makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, yeah. So the thing is, remote forces creation of rock problem is what I'm trying to say. Meanwhile, working in agencies, I've seen a lot of monkey problems. I've seen a lot of, you know, urgency of let's call out a meeting for this because a client just called and said there is a problem, which is literally the definition for the monkey problem. And we all went yeah. into this room and there was no structure around how do we define the solution problem. So I think that remote works better 99% of the case. The only case where actually being in a room makes more sense to me is the case where there needs to be a lot of time spent together in an unstructured conversation to try to get to the bottom of strategic conversation, right? So um, mm -hmm. early kickoff, for example, is a great example of that where there's less structure. There's, it's more about trying to draft what is the vision for the company for the next year. So yeah, the, the um, chaos is part of the conversation, right? It needed part of the conversation. So in this case, Zoom doesn't work as, as well um, because um, it's very easy to get distracted when you're in a Zoom call, you see sure. your email pop up and you see a Slack notification. So sure, yeah, sure. forcing this, this makes more sense in this case, in my opinion. Interesting. So, so it definitely sounds like there are, you say times where it is better to, again, be physically together in, in a room together. And I think you kind of brought up some of those ideas. It could be a quarterly kickoff. It could be a, a board meeting, again, maybe focusing specifically on a strategic item where, yeah, it's just having a bunch of people throwing ideas. It's not, as you said, the kind of yeah. rocket. I just need a pen. Let me draw this here. We have an issue, a UX issue. Let's just draw on the board or digital mm -hmm. whiteboard and bang, solve, problem solved versus let's getting a couple of people in the room and just throwing out ideas. Any other specific times or examples you think, hey, if you can get the team in, in person because the, there's a greater benefit there? I, I don't think so. Apart from the benefit of bonding, um, the reality is that we, uh, we don't see, we don't see a, a main difference. And again, actually I'm a big proponent of remote for one reason that you all see throughout this whole conversation. I'm going to go back to a term, which is the intentionality of remote, right? Which is everything you yep. do in a remote setting forces you to be intentional. And you know, um, yep. I, I live in Paris. We have a few employees in Paris. The first time we had an employee in Paris actually come to the WeWork space that I usually work from, I, it reminded me, it was like PTSD flashback from the time where I was in an office and, you know, the tap <laughs> on the shoulder, the distraction, the concern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, intention is not as prominent in a non-remote environment because you, it's very, uh, people are available, right? You can call out a, a meeting. You can tap on someone's shoulder and ask them. So I love remote for that, that everyone just strive on this intentionality of you can just ask me anything at any point in time. You have to define yeah. the things that you want to ask. You have to define the problem. You have to define workshops. Like it's not it, my job, yeah, 100%. my time is worth something, right? So it's, uh, yeah. it's uh, that's what I love, I think. So no, I, I'm a big proponent of non-live non meetings, apart from the kickoffs yeah. that are just long sessions. <laughs> Uh, great point. It's the number one word that's come across however many 30 something of these episodes over the last year plus has been intentionality. And, and anyone obviously who's been doing this pre pandemic, that's the key to successful remote work is having that intentional push in whatever, whatever you may be doing. And I think that's the biggest issue. A lot of these companies are still battling now that why they want to get people back in the office. It's Oh, you know, mentoring and learning development just isn't the same because you, you aren't there to, to look over your colleague's shoulder. People aren't having the same conversations. These ideas, brain, you know, these great ideas that just happen to happen in the hallway just aren't happening because people aren't in the hallway. And my response to that, it's the problem is it's companies haven't been thinking, okay, how do we redesign this experience for a remote environment? You know, yes, you're not going to see somebody looking over your shoulder, which I, maybe it's just me. I just don't believe people learn through osmosis of looking over your shoulder and some magically they're going to like become a much better developer, but okay. And how do you do no one-on-ones or no lunch and learns or bringing in mentors? Like again, how do you recreate that experience now for a remote environment and doing it intentionally? Because that's, if you're not doing it intentionally, it's not going to happen by itself, especially if you haven't been in the environment to do that, you know, these little water cooler conversations that happen every day in the office, like they're not going to happen by themselves. Now that the company's working remotely, like you need to embed the tools and the process and the procedures to make this happen or it's just not going to happen. Exactly. And I, <laughs> I read the rituals within your org. That's the problem, right? Like uh, you can't expect things to happen magically. And I think that's what we've seen the most. So we've seen the two cases, right? The one where people try to replicate what they've seen in an office. So let's try to be live. Uh, from nine to five, which just it defeats the whole purpose of, of being yep. remote. 
and then not setting up the rituals that you need to have for remote culture to happen, right? And I think, again, yeah. going back to the intentionality, when you have an office, you assume culture will arise, right? It's like a petri dish. Yeah. It's just there. Okay, cool. Sure. It's happened. And that's the culture. Yeah. Remote forces you to be, to be, to create a culture. It forces you to think about what, what are the values we want to pass to people? What are the rituals yeah. we have? What do we care about as a company? And for us, for example, we, we haven't, we, because of COVID, we couldn't meet for two years, right? So we scaled the company yeah. from eight to a hundred people. And I've only met at the time, 10 people from my company, right? That was the extent wow. of which I knew my company. And so yeah. in November, we were able to, in October, we were able to do our first uh, remote offsite in two years, right? And so the Amazing. key question that was in my mind was, are we going to see the culture that we think we have actually materialized, yeah. right? It, it was a big topic. And it, it did, right? Because we, A, we were very intentional about our hiring process, about making sure that we are hiring yep. people for the culture we had. So already yep. this is a big point of building the culture. And then yep. structure the cultures so that the people actually felt like they were part of the same team, part of the same company, the same culture. And that, that transpired yep. in the offsite, right? Everyone felt like they knew each other forever, that they were part of the yeah. same team. And that's, that's yeah, Fantastic. That, that's proof that you can actually build culture, even if you don't meet for two years, which I think is, uh, is probably a strong point. Yeah. Uh, as an argue, I, argument I make all the time, it's the office and all the things there have absolutely nothing to do with the culture. It's the people there. Um, but I exactly. love your point before about the, the first person that you hired in Paris, when you, you met them in person, they came to the office and they're like PTSD. I remember my first day of Envision, I came into the, the Regis space that uh, the, the two co-founders had. And I remember Clark saying to me, he's like, why the hell are you here? I'm like, no, it's like the first day. I want to, I want, I want to meet you. I want to see you. He's like, okay, you don't, you don't need to, you know, you need to, like, don't feel like you need to come here. Um, and I said, okay. And I think that was, I may have come back once again over like mm -hmm. the next four year period for some odd reason, which again, I probably got the same exact answer of, or question of like, why exactly <laughs> are you here? <laughs> yeah. Um, but Kind of hearing through what you're talking about for those kind of purposes, maybe of having people in the room. This is something that I felt, and I think that actually came up in a, in a topic in a conversation uh, around team engagement um, of how do, especially in Zoom, how do you get full participation? I think that's potentially why you know, some people say, "Hey, we, we want to get people in the office because again, all five people are sitting there, and we know in theory those five people are all going to speak." Yes or no. Um, but now if you have yourself and you have like little boxes where you know, maybe a whole bunch of them you can't see because you can only see like a certain amount in there. How can remote teams ensure there's really full participation when collaborating or brainstorming you know, in meetings via Zoom or similar tools? Yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough one because I think that even in non-remote settings, it's very hard to get full participation anyways, right? Like the reality is that you, you can get better at it, but it's, it's always going to be... Uh, a challenge to get everyone at the same level of participation. But I think that it, it comes down to two things. It comes down of to the, si the size of the team collaborating. Um, when we worked, so one of our advisors is Elena Vernage, and she was the acting CMO at Miro and Netlify and a bunch of great remote companies that have actually embedded these processes. And what she's saying is, um, A, more than five people in a meeting, you're going to get less than five people collaborating because the thing is that the yeah. level of collaboration actually decreases with the number of people, right? People don't feel yeah. as inclined. It's, it's the bystander effect, right? All of a sudden, no one sure. is concerned because everyone is, right? So it's, uh, so yeah. keeping it below five people, I think it's really important. And then it's all about the host. So A, it's about um, making sure that, uh, oh, give me one. Do you hear the background? Okay, can we cut this part? Yeah, I can edit it out. No problem. Um, so that's we're going. No, no. It, this will make it to one of the outtakes, uh, the fun outtakes okay. uh, afterwards. Cool, cool. cool. <laughs> um, cool. So yeah, getting back to it. Um, to I host. think it's a the size, the size of the team and the host. So <laughs> the, um, yeah, that's the delivery of Amazon. So the host, I think it's super important for two things. On one end, it's important because they will be the one drafting the workshop. So making sure that the workshop is actually structured, preparing for the workshop for everyone, sharing material ahead of the workshop as well, ahead of the collaboration yep. piece so that people arrive and yep. they're not called into the, what's going to happen in this meeting. And then making sure people are engaged throughout the meeting as well, right? So the one that's actually calling out the meeting should be the one that's driving end-to-end -end the meeting and, and what's happening yep. in those meetings. 
So that that's what we've seen work, right? It's great preparation, uh, host that's actually engaging with all, and then a limited number of people within the team collaborating uh, on a specific topic. And generally, this involves the stakeholder, the so basically the one that's actually going to enforce the strategy for what the outcome of the meeting, and then the execution team, right? So the one that's actually going yep. to execute against what the program that we're trying to solve. That's what we've seen work really well. I love that. I especially love the idea of sending the material ahead of time. Um, I've spoken yeah. about that quite a few times on the idea of getting rid of meetings and how to kill off meetings. Um, one of the mm -hmm. things that I like and to do, and again, this I think came up in a previous episode is, I think especially as you put it as it's on the shoulders of the host saying, giving, let again, five people, we'll go with that answer of, each person has 30 or 60 seconds where each person's expected to give feedback mm. again, to ensure that everyone has the opportunity. So it's not, you know, the one or two people who are maybe the extroverts were very, you know, taking over the meeting. It's everyone has like a timer. You got 30 seconds, 60 seconds, everyone give your feedback about these ideas, what approach to be. So you ensure again, that everyone has that chance to, to voice their, their opinion, voice their feedback uh, and ensure that, one or two people don't take over the meeting versus you still have everyone has uh, the equal opportunity to speak. This is a pre presidential yeah. campaign type of thing where everyone's timed to, so that you make sure that everyone has the same. I like it a lot, actually. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, and maybe you can tell us, tell everybody a little bit more about your process or the process uh, in, in Maze about how you do your brainstorming collaboration process of you no know, features or bugs or where the strategy is coming and going. Who's involved in those sessions and what tools are using to, to go through those meetings? Yeah, we're, we're very light on tools. The reality is that we probably use Miro and Zoom for those 99% of the case. There's very, very little other tools that we use. I think depending. So there, there's five questions in, the, in there. So I'm trying to, I'm going to try to go through a little bit. Basically <laughs> for the strategy meetings, we have an, an E-team. So the way we work, we work as a W. So basically we have an E-team, which is the, the senior management team. We have what we call the SLT, which is uh, one level below. And so the goal is drafting the strategy, giving the strategy back to the SLT so that they can go back with feedback from their team to the E-team. So it's kind of a W where we always go back and forth between management, senior level management and, and uh, medium level management. So that works really well. Great. Um, and the goal is I'm driving the, the meeting with the E-team. So I'm the one with the BizOps preparing the E-team meeting and, and, and uh, creating the strategy. And then what I really like is that now what we're doing is that the E-team will present to the SLT. So it's, there's basically ownership that goes down because it's, we sure. make sure that we align as an E-team, then the E-team pass it down to the SLT. And so they make sure that they are aligned with the SLT and the SLT pass them down to the ICs that will actually execute against the plan. So it's, uh, it's ownership all the way down and it goes back and forth so that we can make sure that we hear from everyone. Um, and for that, it's, it's very simple again, right? We start with the brainstorming on Zoom and Miro. We prepare the meeting so that, um, we have a kickoff where we try to define what we call the complete. So what are the problems that we're trying to solve as a company? Like what are the big things that are not working and the resolution, which is how do we solve for that? And then we have a full framework of like, these are the guiding policies. So these are the high level picture of how we're going to solve the problem. And then we have coherent actions, which are how we think we're going to solve the problem for the guiding policy. So it, it, it structures the conversation a lot, right? Because we also, also have a common language on how we talk about these things. That's worked well. Um, I can talk a bit about product as well, uh, which is how do we define yeah, product? How do we build new product? Um, it, it, there's a lot to unpack here, but also, so there's two ways. Um, the the E-team will own so when we look at features and when we look at product, there's four risks that we need to assess, right? The business risk, the value risk, the usability risk, the facility risk. The business risk is owned by both the E-team and the researchers. So the goal here is to define is what is the market problem that we're trying to solve for, right? And what is the user yep. problem we're trying to solve for? So we'll try to draft both from hearing from our customers. So the CX team, uh, Brendan from Invision, <laughs> namely, uh, sure. is, is gathering information on um, on on the problems that our customers are having. So we are using both the customer feedback, what we think is the direction we want to go for the company. And then we'll test this both qualitatively. So we'll have users interviews for our researchers that will come back with uh, yeah. more depth on the problem. And then we'll validate that quantitatively by only using Maze, right? So Maze is a critical part of the whole journey of validation. Sure. So once the business risk is, is settled, we pass it down to the PMs and the PMs, what they'll do is they'll assess the value risk. So on their end, they will start brainstorming on what is the right solution to solve for that problem. So kick off with their pod, 
where they will uh, draft a strategy of solution that they can actually develop for solving this specific problem. Test it qualitatively by asking customers and getting more feedback on the solution, validate it quantitatively. Yep. By using it. And so you see this loop kind of going back and forth. Uh, that's what we'll do every step of the, the feature development process. And that's great because it creates accountability at every point of development, right? Are we building for the right problem? Are we building for the right solution for that problem? Are we building the right design? Are we building the right value proposition? All of these things, it's like a relay race, right? Where everyone just yeah. run and pass down the response. That sounds interesting. Have you ever felt that there was an instance or instances of failure because people weren't in the same room, you know, making a specific decision, whether it's product or strategy? Mm, I don't think so. And so, yes. So the, the problem is the, probably the framing of the question. I don't think it was failure. I think that realizing that we are wrong is actually a success, right? Before I should sure, <laughs> think sure, sure. something. Um, so it, it happened in cases where, um, yes, at mi middle of the process, we realized, oh, actually, no one wants this, right? Actually, this is not going to work because it's not solving for the problem. So it goes back to what I just said, which is this kind of loop of we think there's a problem. And then it's passed on to the PMs and they think there's a solution. And then we actually test out the solution before it's being built. We realize this sucks, right? No one wants uh, uh, this thing. I remember a specific example where we tried to create a trailer like experience inside of Maze where people could move like their project ahead. And people were like, this is stupid, right? We have Trello. Why, why do we need to do this yeah. inside of Maze? And we're like, that's true. This is stupid. And so <laughs> we just killed it off. But the reality was it's not yeah. failure. It's actually a big success, right? Because we could have released that. It would have damaged the product. It would have cost a ton of development time and then legacy of product that we would have to actually destroy, right? So it's it's not so much a failure. It's a, a success of not building the wrong thing, I would say. I like that answer. I like that answer. Um, to kind of go maybe more deep into where remote is going, um, you mentioned the word earlier on when we were speaking about async. Uh, I think it was maybe like a week or two ago, I saw a post of yours on LinkedIn about a beta feature that you guys have rolled out uh, for screen recordings, which is uh, awesome. Um, so now in theory, instead of having, it could have been a live setting where somebody, would, maybe both people were on maze and one was watching, or it was like a screen share. And again, I'm watching you do whatever you may do. You now have the ability to do that asynchronously. Um, we'd love to know what the onus was for this feature and like what really was driver behind, Hey, again, maybe we don't even need to be doing these live sessions here and you know, pushing that forward. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, the, we, we're building this not in a position to live session. I think that live sessions are still valuable, but the problem is live session has been the default tools for a lot of things when they're actually needed. Right. Um, for us, what we see is that live sessions are to be used to get more depth uh, in understanding a problem, understanding a solution. Basically, it's, yep. it's useful time when you don't know what's going to be the outcome of the conversation. Basically, you start with a plan, and then from the plan, you actually derive from what the users want to talk about and what is the, what is the problem that are responsible for and the solution that are responsible for. Um, what we saw on our end was that the quantitative feedback that we are providing, historically, we've only provided quantitative feedback at Maze, right? was yeah. was great. It allowed for people to make fast decisions. And the key thing that we try to derive at Maze is what we call time to decision, which is how fast you can go from having a decision to make to how fast you can make this decision. Um, yeah. And the key question was, how do we add more empathy into the process? How do we add mm. um, a way for people to also get beyond the data and understand that there's actual humans that are going through the process of testing your product and not understanding this thing? Sure. And, and how do we make that without um, without losing in speed, right? How do we do that without losing in our capacity to go and drive this time to decision, right? Because if at the end of the yeah. day you have 500 recordings, you're not going to go through the 500 hours of recording. Sure. So clips, and the name is, uh, the name is, is really, the, the, the response is in the name. The goal was let's clip out the moments of failures for our users so that it only focuses not on the success because no one cares about success, right? Because success, mm -hmm. people are successful, that's good, right? Cool, that you, yeah. you haven't done anything. Yeah. Um, exactly. When people are failing, that's when you need to know. And the thing is that because we have a unique technology that allows us to understand when people are failing through the testing process, let's use awesome. this exact same technology and extract the clips of failures. Uh, so that's what mm. that's what's been driving that. It's bringing more empathy without losing blame to decision and the speed that you get uh, those insights. So yeah, that's uh, that's exciting. Very exciting new release.
Yeah, that sounds like an absolutely fantastic idea. And it seems the whole async sync, even other places I remember of mentoring individual business owners, like a no music teacher, it's like, okay, with your amount of yeah. time, how many user sessions, interview sessions, UX sessions, can you possibly do? You have a finite number with a finite amount of time. So you're only going to get a limited amount of data. But now if you, again, put something online, you record a session, you record a class, or you have this, it just cuts, you know, the, the 10 seconds here and the 10 out of a, no, a 30 minute session. Again, you, instead of getting, you know, maybe 20 interviews, now you get 200 and you could see so much more data and so much more breadth of knowledge um, and experience from those little clips than you can of being limited by having to just do a, a synchronous uh, user testing session. That's interesting. Exactly. And I think, so, I, I fully agree. I think, hey, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. No, 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 no. You, um, no, I was just going to say, I think that uh, COVID forced a lot of these conversations to happen. Just like you, I have a, I've been mentoring a, a yoga class company, uh, funny enough. Yeah. And the same thing, right? How do you scale yourself has always been the question. You're just yeah. one of you and there's yeah. uh, eight, 10 hours per day that you can work. Uh, how are you going to do yeah. more sessions? And so all of a sudden they had to rethink their job, right? How do I make yoga online and how do I? And it for yeah. a lot of people, it turned out for the better, right? Because all of a sudden your exposure yeah. was uh, broader. The people you could reach was broader, both ge also geographically, right? And all of a sudden sure. your music teacher, they were limited to the people that they could actually meet physically. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah, it's been pretty incredible. I think that we're going to see a, a massive shift in in this uh, in the, in the space of the let's say the creative industry in general and their approach to remote. So it's, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it's interesting. Then I guess then know what happens. Then you have you know five thousand uh, yoga apps, and it's like okay, no, what's what's the <laughs> real differentiation between uh, you know this one and that one? Um, but I guess we'll have to get there. Uh, maybe talk a little bit more about your team. Um, are you are you shifting the organization, the operations more towards async um, outside of maybe just again whiteboarding sessions that or design collaboration that seems to be the optimal place, kind of like what you're doing where. Again, giving specific feedback, you know, maybe in a product roadmap or a specific feature conversation, yes, async would be fantastic here. But are you thinking, are you already moving this direction for running the entire company and all meetings and all processes towards async? So it's a very good question because it's very, very topical for us right now. Amazing. So because we've scaled dramatically, we, we now are in 32 countries, but most of the time zones are either, let's say, Israel and then um, yep. US, right? So those are the, the two time zones. And most sure. product is Europe time zone and most um, go to market is US time zone. And so the question that we started asking ourselves is, can we hire for product people in the US or in Asia or like where, mm -hmm. where, how remote do we really want to be and how async do we really want to be, right? And this conversation is driven by two types of people. It's driven by on one end, for example, our VP of people uh, that came from GitLab, where remote is the absolute, async is the absolute standard. Sure. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, we have, for example, our VP of marketing that comes from where she comes from an in-office job, right? So it's it's a mm -hmm. lot of um, trying to find the right balance. And I think that we're ending yeah. in the place where we'll never be fully async and we're okay with that. I think that um, yeah. the way the, the company is structured right now, we're still reliant on some meetings. We're still reliant on... Uh, some face-to-face -face time, and especially on the execution pods, they really like to actually meet and, and spend time together and work together. To work sure. Towards. So we're never we're never going to be fully, fully async. We're just trying to drive more and more decisions to be made asynchronously, but we're okay with being reliant still on, you know, stand-ups if the product teams want to do stand-ups and, uh, you yep. know, uh, sales kickoff for the sales team. Like, it's okay to still rely on some synchronous meeting. Sure. I like that answer. I like that answer, yeah. It's... I think like anything, it, it comes down to each company culture. You know, for some companies, it's 100% async. Some some companies, it's 20% async. Some thing, companies, it's everywhere in between and having to find what works best for your company. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the idea of, you know, bringing the VP of GitLab. And that was always a lot of feedback. It's when you're building a culture, you're doing it. You can't just take you know, all the GitLab documents and ma manuals and things. It's like, oh, okay, this is we're gonna, this is the way that we're going to do it, and it's going to work fantastically. Well, that's yeah, that, that's GitLab, and it works fantastically for GitLab. But for somebody else, that's that's just not the way it is. Exactly, exactly. That's uh, trying to apply playbook. It's like 
It's also, there's a lot of debate in the remote space around remote feels almost like a religion in itself, right? There's big principles. Oh yeah. The reality is that do, do what works for you and your company and the, yeah. and the people in your company, right? Like there's no, and, and what's beautiful as well is, um, everything is being built, right? Meaning that most of the knowledge we have on remote is based off 10 companies that have done it right. Right. So it's, uh, exactly. you, if you're a remote company now, you're part of creating what remote means for the future generation as well, right? There, there's yeah. a beauty in uh, it as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, we often say at Maze that we're building the best company in the world. But for us, what that means is that um, we, we have the means to, to do whatever feels right for us, right? Uh, both in terms of yeah. time off and in terms of how we think about uh, uh, people's work and people's work time, like all of this, no one else but us can define what needs to be the best company. So it's, uh, yeah, yeah. I think it, it's great. Yeah. I, I love to see, especially with these early kind of young, um, remote companies that I, what I've seen, it's, they're the ones really the four who are putting much more of the emphasis on culture and especially mm-hmm. starting back at the, the application side where I've you know, been to many of these sites. And when you go looking at some, uh, no job rec, you know, there's a link to a notion, a very detailed multi-section notion document about everything about the culture and how they communicate and how they work and what they believe in and what this is and videos and testimonials and things like that. And I think that's fantastic because for me, yeah. you know, culture starts at the application phase and that's, you know, having one thing is having the salary amount on there. Like that, I, that's like, yeah. that's one of the most uncomfortable questions you ever get. Well, what kind of salary are you looking at? Well, why don't you tell me ahead of time? So I know whether this is relevant or not, but it's great to see like, there's such a focus from like the remote religion that, Hey, we have to be intentional about culture. So we have to be very focused in writing this and be very clear. So when people come in or even interested in us, Hey, before you even have that first conversation, like, is this a cultural place for them? Like, is this where they want to be? And I think, you know, you're definitely right. It's going to be these companies that are taking what GitLab did and what automatic and wild bit and envision did for all these years. And now saying, okay, that was amazing. And here, now that the rest of the world is doing this and now the majority of the world is doing this and now you can start an early stage company and you could be async from day one and how we're doing these things. It's super, super exciting. Exactly. exactly. It's so super, super exciting. That, yeah. I think the last question I have for you, um, for today is you no, know, there's been good or bad. It will still be mm-hmm. to be determined a lot of push towards hybrid. Um, mm-hmm. again, I have my opinions about that. Um, but maybe what Dude. advice can you give T? Te- <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it's for companies who were doing a hybrid in the way that an office, number one, is in the central headquarters. And number two, it's there as a perk, right? If you want to use this, how you want to use it, when you want to use it, why you want to use it. Great. You don't want to use it. That's equally as great. But any of these other things that it's either like a central office, like if you're living in the, the suburbs of Paris, even if it's a park, like if it's a 60 minute commute, I mean, how often are you really going to go in there? I mean, even if you're allowed to have the flexibility versus these crazy companies are trying to push, you know, three, two hybrid models and all kind of whatever nonsense. Uh, but for these companies who are going to, who are looking or doing that hybrid setup, maybe you have some advice of how to best collaborate in a hybrid environment where, again, you have that classic example. You have three people in a conference room and they have two people or three people on a Zoom call. Like, how can you, how, what advice can you give to them to potentially ensure that there is good collaboration, there's good communication, there's good inclusion for when, again, you have some people together, huddled up together, and other people are wherever they are? You're not going to like my answer to this, but it's, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, the, the world's not going to like my answer. I haven't seen hybrid work. I haven't seen, so th- that's the problem, right? It's, um, I think that you be, so it goes back to the intentional D and it goes back to, the means of communication. Um, yeah, there needs to be one way for people to communicate information and pass down this information. In the, sure. the problem with hybrid is that, um, how does it work for people to be in an office and be able to tap on the shoulder and have a conversation and discuss data while others don't have yeah. access to this information, right? So either you have, you have a rigor that I've never seen, which is you have this conversation and then you type it out so that others can actually see, never yeah. seen that happen in yeah. my life. Um, or the people that are remote are going to feel excluded from the company. And this is what I see yeah. most often. It's like, I feel like a freelancer in a company that exists somewhere else. Right. Um, so I don't have a great answer for you on this topic. I think that, um, 
maybe some company can prove me wrong and I'd be more than happy to see hybrid actually work. Uh, yeah. On my end, I have not seen that. So it's, uh, uh, I'll, uh, that's a, a hill I'm willing to die on today. That's, that's fine. Uh, prove wrong everyone. Yeah. I, 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 to be honest, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. I think it's on that, the other side of, again, that flexibility piece where there are certain people who just don't have the space at home, don't have the right work environment, who don't, who need to be out of the house. And I remember the early days in Envision, I think we hired two people, fantastic people that just didn't work out because they just couldn't wrap their head around being in a quiet apartment all at home, like all alone and no one, no noise, no action, and it didn't work out. And they were there for maybe six something, maybe months at most. And they left again, not because they were great, not because they couldn't do the job, because they just, they needed that noise and action. So I think that's, I think the, the interesting trade-off is again, there's going to be certain people who just can't work at home for whatever reason. And I think like you've mentioned, everything has to be intentional. So even if you are in an office or, or mixed, like every meeting that you do, there's no conference rooms anymore. Or if you want to be in a conference room, great, but everyone's on the same the Zoom box. Now, everyone has to have equal real estate. Everyone has to have equal representation. Um, because I, I remember mentoring a company here, in, I think actually in the community, this is probably back like six years. They had like a handful of people in their office. They hired one person in New York and they wanted to go remote. And I said, listen, all those like chit chats, all the things you do, you have to now push in Slack because you now need to get in the sense of putting everything online, all those questions and having a central source of truth just so there's a central place. But also now is like that person comes on in New York and potentially future for where you go, like they need to be included in those conversations. They need to have the ability to be included and to know what's going on and have that feedback. Because yeah, if you're just asking the person next to you, they're never gonna know that question was asked and you're never gonna be able to share knowledge and it's a huge issue. So just the operations of, I think any hybrid company has to be as a remote first company. You can have the space take it or leave it, but yeah. you have to operate completely remote first or you're set to fail. Exactly. And I think, and I much prefer, I mean, I have literally nothing against in-office companies like the, to the opposite. I think that in-office companies work well as well. Like uh, the reality is, I think just hybrid is kind of the way that people have coped with COVID, right? For a lot of these companies. Yeah, like, exactly. Oh, we, we, are, we are used to having an office now remote is competitive. So let's hire remotely. So it's, it's kind of yep. the adding more option in your option menu when you're building a product, right? It's, that's not how you solve yep. a problem. You're just adding more yep. options, but at the end of the day, you're not being opinionated in how you want things to be run. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I fully agree with you. And I think it's fine that also remote is not for everyone. Uh, I think that it's very sure. important for people to know if they want or not want to work remotely. We've had cases as well where people have struggled with, you know, um, I want to meet people. I want to meet people. I want to have yep. the sales day beer and that's, Fine. That's entirely fine. Uh, just sure. like the employer needs to be intentional about how they hire, the employees need to be intentional about what they expect from a job. And for some people, yep. that's more social connection. That's more things that yep. remote can provide. And that's fine. That's okay. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. Um, so for everyone listening, how can they find more about you, more about Maze? How can they get a hold of you, get a hold of Maze? All that good stuff. Yes. Yeah. So go to maze.co, obviously, uh, if you're working in product, uh, any form of product, really anyone's working in product these days, uh, go to maze.co. Um, you'll be able to go and get some insights fast, build more user centricity nice. for your company, be more connected with your users. And if you want to find more about me, uh, I'm mostly on Twitter and LinkedIn. So LinkedIn, uh, Jonathan Rydavsky, I'm assuming you're going to put out my last name because otherwise people will never figure it out. Uh, uh other profiles in there as well. People. <laughs> cool. I'm right here, but yeah, also I, I miss the, the I miss Maze dot design. How many times in Vision when no. people are asking me these tools, I'm like, yeah, Maze dot design, Maze dot design, Maze. I was like almost on like on like an auto hotkey uh, type thing. <laughs> but I guess you had to graduate, you had to get bigger, so you had to get you had to get the co, and eventually you'll you'll have to go and take the uh, the dot com as well to make it official. Oh man, this is. The story for another podcast, for a full hour podcast, I'll talk about maze.com at some point and, and, I'll, and I'll try to actually get the domain, but that's, that's another story. Another time. Uh, excellent. So Joe, thank you so much for joining today and sharing how you've been collaborating, how your team collaborates and makes decisions uh, remotely and sharing that insight with community. Because again, as, as I said, started off, you know, even there's lots of people who've been doing this for a long time, but still believe that you can't get the same experience. So greatly appreciate uh, you sharing the feedback and the insight and uh, until the next episode, have a great day, everybody.
Thanks again, everybody, for tuning into today's episode of Leading from Afar. If you enjoyed the podcast, you can learn more on our website, leadingfromafar.com, and subscribe to the podcast in your favorite app. This podcast is all about you, the remote leaders. We'd love to hear from you with your feedback or ideas for future topics and remote leaders we should be speaking with. Mm-hmm.